Father, we come to you in the precious name of Jesus. We're so grateful to be in your house today with your people. We ask that you may open up our understanding of your word, plant it deep within our hearts. May we have spiritual ears to hear what you want to say to us. And not only be a hearer, Lord, but a doer of your word. We ask that you might be glorified. Holy Spirit, come and teach us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You have your Bibles with you. I'm just going to take a, par- a portion of a scripture verse. It comes from 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. Just the first phrase. 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. And in it you'll find this statement. For whatever is born of God overcomes. Whatever is born of God overcomes. How many people here are born again? Well, maybe I better change my sermon a little bit. I'll give you one more chance. How many people here know they're born again? That's better. If you're born again, then you're called upon, you're challenged to, you are expected to overcome, to be an overcomer. The Greek word for overcoming is naiko, N-I-K-A-O. It's Greek. And this is what it means to overcome, to gain the victory, to conquer, to prevail, to subdue, to bring under control, to win. Well, what are we to overcome? The scripture tells us there are three areas in your life that you should be overcoming in. I will read you and see if you can spot what they are. The first one, Romans 12, 21. It says, be not overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. Did you catch what it is? What's the first one? First area in your life, evil, Evil. sin, ungodliness, impurity, that which is unholy. But not only are we to overcome sin, we're to overcome the one who causes it, the source of sin, which is Satan himself, okay? We are to overcome, be overcomers when it comes to dealing with Satan as well as sin. The second one you find in 1 John 5 and 4, which I just read, For whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. What's the second one? The world. The world. The world. Its standards, its attitudes, its behavior, all its practices, all the wrong things out there, all the things that the world tempts us with, would overcome them. Would overcome them. The third one you find is in Romans 13 and 14, where it says, make no provision, make no room for Don't yield to the works of the flesh. We're talking about the flesh. Folks understand we're talking about this fallen nature. Yes, we're born again, but we still have a nature that we battle with inside us. And if you're not sure exactly what the outcome of the nature is, all you have to do is look in Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 to 25, and you will find 17 Different works of the flesh. And there's lots more besides those. So, we're to overcome in the world of sin. We're to overcome in the world itself. And we're to overcome this flesh. Those are the things we battle with. Those are the things we've got to overcome. And there's some pretty good reasons. I don't like doing something unless I have a reason to do it. And the scripture tells us some really good reasons why we need to overcome in these areas. One, is they rob us with our our relationship with the Lord. These things will rob you of it. Two, they keep us from inheriting the kingdom of God. Three, they damage our spirit man. And four, they will eventually bring spiritual death. That's four powerful reasons why we need to overcome. But you know, that's a pretty tall order. It is. It's going to require a lot of work, a lot of effort, I know But consider the rewards for doing it. Consider the rewards for being successful in overcoming in these three areas. If you have your Bible still with you, you can turn to Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3. The whole chapter, chapter 2 and chapter 3. And Jesus is talking not only to the believers in the seven churches, he's talking to us. What he said to them applies to us. And listen to what he says. In every one of these verses I'm about to share with you, it begins with 
Every one of these promises begins with to him or her that overcomes. You'll find that in every one of these promises, every one of these verses. To him or her that overcomes. I want you to listen because there's some powerful, wonderful, exciting, encouraging scriptures connected with overcoming. First one, Revelations 2 and 7. To him or her overcomes, I will give to eat of the tree of life. That's the promise of eternal life. To an overcomer, he promises eternal life. Revelations 2 and 11. They shall not be heard of the second death, the lake of fire, eternal punishment. That is a promise to us of escape. You're not going to spend it in the lake of fire. Revelations 2 and 17. There's two in this one. To those that overcome, he will give to eat of the hidden manna. Who's he talking about? One day Jesus stood up in the temple and he declared, they were talking about the manna that God fed Israel when they came out of Egypt. And Jesus stood up and said, I am the bread of life. I am that manna. So he will give to us to eat of the hidden manna. In other words, he will give us to eat of him. He will provide for us spiritual sustenance and life. That's a promise. He'll sustain you spiritually. Give you life. Revelation 2.26 to them that overcome, he will give power over the nations. That's a promise to reign with him. Grab a hold of that one. The second part, he says, or sorry, the Revelation 3 and 5 have uh, three things. Let me back up, I forgot one. In Revelations 2 and 17, not only will he give up the hidden manna, he will give us a white stone. Have you got any idea what that is? Do you know what that is, Sylvia? In Jesus' culture, having a white stone has three possibilities. One, it's a pardon from the court. If you were taken before a court and you were tried and you were found guilty, they would give you a black stone, which indicated punishment. But if you were innocent or they found you not guilty, they gave you a white stone, which means you're free. You're free. If he gives you a white stone, they that overcome will receive a white stone. You know what he's saying? You're pardoned. You're pardoned. You're free. Not only that, if you received the white stone, another possibility, it meant you were invited to a very important banquet. We're invited to a very important banquet, folks. Amen. Yes, we are. <laughs> or, if you were given a white stone... It stood for, symbolized a new name. A new name. A new life. A new start. A new existence. Revelations 3 and 5. There's three in this one. He says, to those that overcome, they shall be clothed in a white garment. A white garment always represents, as far as spiritual concerns are concerned, as far as spiritual things are concerned, it always means righteousness and holiness. That's what he's giving you. Okay? He said, in addition to that, I will not blot their name under the book of life. Do you understand what I'm saying here? These are promises given by the Lord Jesus to any person who is an overcomer. Thirdly, I will confess his or her name before the Father and angels. I love that one. How would you like your name? How would you like the Father and the angels of heaven to know your name? Think about it for a moment. All the billions of people on this earth, how would you like heaven to know? I know who that is. I know their name. What an honor. That's what it speaks of. It speaks of, of the promise of security, and honor, and recognition. Revelation 3 and 12 says, I will make them, he that overcomes, I will make them a pillar in the temple of God. That means to be used in the service of God, to uphold his temple, to be used in service. He says, I will write on them the name of God. That speaks of ownership. Do you know you're stamped? You have a stamp on you. 
And God says, he's mine. She's mine. They're mine. And that owner's stamp can never be removed. That's a stamp for an overcomer. He goes on to say that oh, I will write on them the city of God. That's the promise of citizenship of heaven forever. Revelation 3 and 21. I will grant that overcomer to sit with him on his throne. Folks, that's the promise of power and authority and position in the coming kingdom. And lastly, Revelation 21 7. They shall inherit all things. He will be our God and we will be his sons and daughters. Those are promises to a person who is an overcomer. Do you think they're worth going after? Yeah, which one of those struck your heart a little bit? We would say, wow. Any one of them? All of them, I hope you say that's right, Brenda. Those are all marvelous. So, Yes. So it's yes, it is. It also says in that same portion of Scripture that God has a new name waiting for you. That stone it symbolizes that a new beginning, a new name. Wow. Those are wonderful promises. There's a lot riding on being an overcomer. Did you know that? A lot riding on it. I just gave you some of the promises. But you might be sitting there saying, wow, I don't know if I can do it. Overcoming sin and the world and this old nature of mine, this flesh, those three things, they fight pretty hard in my life. I have trouble with them. I really got to work on them. Well, the Lord knows that. And he promised to help. Like what? How? Well, for one, John 6, Be of good cheer, because I have overcome the world. Hebrews 2 and 18 says, he is able to secure. That means he's able to help. And I like the other meaning. He is, he is able to run to the aid of. When he sees you in trouble, when he sees you in that, that fight, when you're trying to overcome the flesh, the world, and sin, and he sees you struggling with it, he will run to your help. Just doesn't, Stroll a little, a little bit of time to get there. He's coming. He knows those that are struggling. And so he will secure them. He offers himself, first of all. He offers himself for help. He offers himself. He invites us to lean on him. To call on him. To look to him. So when you're in that battle and you're trying to overcome something, don't be afraid to lift your head and say, help Jesus. I need your help, Lord. I'm struggling here. I've a, got a battle on my hands. Help Jesus. He'll be there. He'll be there. Secondly, John, 1 John 4 and 4. You know this one. Greater is he that's in me than anything out there in that world. Greater is he that's in me. Who's the he? That's what mostly you think, but it's not. That's right. Okay. It's the Holy Spirit that Jesus promised. When he left, he said, I got to go home, boys. I'll take care of you up, up, up there interceding for you and, and praying for you and looking after you, but I'm going to send someone who can live in you. I, can, I got one body here. I can only be one place at one time in this resurrected body, but I'll send you a spirit who can be anywhere in anybody. So he sent the Holy Spirit that's in you. Now understand, Jesus is in us. His nature is in us. That's what's in us. His nature. But it's His Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit that's in you. Can I say that again? We all have, that are born again, we have Jesus' nature in us. But we also have the person, a real live person, called the Holy Spirit, who lives in you. And why do you think He's there? To help. To help. To help you overcome. So why don't you ask, Holy Spirit, teach me how to overcome. Teach me how to do this. I want to know. Any more? I should also mention too, while I think of it, 
that the Holy Spirit is God, is he not? Part of the Godhead? There is nothing, including the enemy. The enemy cannot overcome the Holy Spirit who lives inside you. Did you know that? The enemy cannot overcome the Holy Spirit who lives inside you. So rely on him. Rely on him when you're in the battle. Any more? Sure. In fact, Flo, you you mentioned it. Revelation 12 and 11. And they overcame by the blood of the Lamb. The blood. Did you know the blood is a key weapon in our arsenal to overcome? A key weapon. So let me ask you, do you know the power of the blood? Do you know how to apply it? Do you know how to use it? If you want to be an overcomer, you need to. It goes on to say, plus, not only the blood of, of the Lamb, they overcame by the word of their testimony, their confession, what they spoke, what they declared, what they claim. Okay? So when it comes to overcoming, what do you and I claim? What do we claim? I am more than a conqueror through him that loved me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. There is no weapon formed against me that's going to prosper. Those are overcoming words. Fourth one. 1 John 5 and 4. Back to the original verse I said. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. We're talking about the God-given faith. Did you know that every one of you has been given a measure of God's faith? It it doesn't have to be that much. Maybe the size of a grain of a mustard seed. And when you put that faith to work, when you use it, it grows and grows and grows. And that faith is what gives you the power to overcome. So let's see. He said he would help. How? He said, I give you myself. Call on me. He said, I've given you my spirit. Call on him. Use him. Let him teach you. I've given you weapons, my blood. I encourage you to use my word as a testimony. And your faith. But the truth is that even with these powerful weapons, it helps that are available, not every believer is walking in the victory they should be walking in. They are defeated in areas of their Christian lives that they should be, that they don't need to be. They struggle, and they struggle. Instead of overcoming, they end up being overcome. They end up living with feelings of failure, and discouragement, with frustration, with guilt, with condemnation. And so some Christians just give up. I know I should be overcoming in these areas. I just can't do it. Even with these helps, I still can't do it. So I quit. Stop serving the Lord. Can you associate with that? Do you know what I'm talking about? Or if you feel like a failure, I can't overcome this. Tried, but I fail. Folks, God never, never intended for you to be like that. Never. So, for a few moments this morning, I would like to give a practical, encouraging, biblical help in this area of overcoming. One. What is the key to overcoming? First of all, you have to understand something. Going back to 1 John 5 and 4, I keep coming back to that verse, which says, whosoever is born of God overcomes. Anything and everything that is born of God has the power to overcome. It's built right in it. Get a hold of that. Anything and everything that God has declared that he's created that's born of God has the power to overcome. He automatically put it in. How do I know? Because is God all-powerful? Has God ever been defeated? Has God ever failed? No, he hasn't. What he plans for, 
And what he creates is always victorious. It'll always be victorious. Even though sometimes you look at it and say, I don't see it. Listen, folks. God created this world and he created you, mankind, for a purpose. And the enemy came along and messed it up through Adam and Eve and their, the temptation they fell. But I want you to know, in the end, God's still going to have a world and he's still going to have a people. Understand that? That's where we're headed. We're just on, we got sidetracked a little bit on the journey. But he's pulling us back in. And there's going to be a world that he's created and you're going to be a part of it if you're born again and following him. God, the devil didn't win. It may look like it, but he didn't win. The devil is a loser. Calvary saw to that. He's a loser. And what God says will come to pass. You may have to wait for it a bit, but it's going to come to pass. Let me ask you then, if that's true, what do you have that's born of God? What do you have inside of you that's born of God? Any idea? That's true. What else? Ah, yes, Sylvia. Okay. Ephesians 2 and 1 says, And you has he quickened, meaning he's made alive, who are dead in trespasses and sin. What in you was made alive? What in you was born again? What part of you was born again? I'll tell you what it wasn't. It wasn't your body. Your body was not, your flesh was not born again. The muscles, tissues, bones. It wasn't your soul, your mind, your will, your intellect, your emotions. That wasn't born again. There's only one thing left. You said it, Sylvia. What was it? Our spirit. Your spirit is what was born again. Now, the scripture has different words for our spirit. Peter tells us it's the hidden person in the heart. Romans tells us it's the inward man or the, or the spirit man. Now, I want you to recognize three really important truths about your spirit man. Number one, your spirit man is the part of you that is in contact with God. God is a spirit. And where he's going to meet you and communicate with you and talk to you is in your spirit, man. Whether you know it or not. It's not here. It's not in your mind. It's not even here in your emotions. Because God is a spirit, he is going to contact you and communicate with you in your spirit. And that's why the ungodly, the unsaved, can experience true communication with God because their spirit is dormant. Their spirit is dormant. And that's what comes alive when you're born again. You who he made alive. Your spirit man was made alive when God came into, into your life, when you invited him in. And if you're not saved, I'm sorry, your spirit man is dormant. You can't contact God. Has no idea. So God doesn't talk to people. Not very much at all. Not, not true communication. The second thing, I said there are three things. The second thing is your spirit is where the Holy Spirit lives. Want to know where he lives? He does not live here, and he doesn't live in your heart, a physical organ. He lives in your spirit. Man. That's where he lives. And that's what he works through. The Holy Spirit, that's where the life of God is released in you. When you're born again, what happens? Your spirit comes alive. And that's where the power of God is released in you. The power that you have in you to overcome is in your spirit person. Thirdly, the third truth, what happens to our inner man, the spirit man, affects the soul. It will affect your mind, your emotions, and affect your will. And your soul, in turn, affects your body. That's how it works. That's how God planned it in the beginning. Spirit would control the soul, which would affect the body. It works perfectly. But when Adam fell, it got all messed up. Because what happens now is our body affects our soul, and the soul doesn't bother with the spirit. Think of it for an unsaved person. They're controlled by their desires, and their lusts, and their reasons. Not by the spirit. 
But when you're saved, when you're born again, it switched back to the right order. It should. Your spirit, man, should control your soul. And your soul then can control the body. So that means that if your inner man is spiritually weak, so will your soul be. And you'll find yourself giving easily into outside forces, into temptations. You find yourself giving to inside forces called desires. And then your body does whatever the soul tells it to. Do you understand that? Let me say it to make sure that you do. If your spirit is weak, the spirit man you is weak, so is your soul. And your soul is going to affect your body. And overcoming is really hard. Because in your body, your desires, your wants, your lusts, all sorts of things run your life. But if your spirit man is strong, you'll be able to overcome because you will control your mind and your, flat and your emotions and your will. That's why Paul prayed this prayer in Ephesians 3.16. That God would grant you according to his riches of glory to be strengthened in the might, with might of the Holy Spirit, where? In your inner man. I'm heading for a point. Stay with me for another minute. Let me say that again. That God would grant you according to the, his riches and glory to be strengthened with the might of the Holy Spirit in your inner man. Here's the main point. If you get nothing else, get this today. The main key to being an overcomer is to keep your inner man strong. Strong and healthy. If you can do that, you will be guaranteed to be an, inner, an overcomer. You got all these other things we mentioned, but I'm telling you, the key to keeping you as an overcomer is to keep your inner man strong and healthy. Well, sounds good, great. But how do I do that? How do I do that? 2 Corinthians 4.16 says, Even though the outer man perishes, yet the inner man is renewed day by day. Renewed means to be refreshed. We need to refresh our inner man daily. How do we do that? Well, the same way you refresh your natural body. There's five things you do. Number one, you feed it. Do you not? Anybody here don't feed their body? <laughs> Unless you're losing weight, I guess, maybe, I don't know. But Jesus himself in Matthew 4, 4 said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So number one, feed your inner man the word. Feed him your word. If we constantly starve ourselves, then our body becomes weak. Yes? Same for your spirit. How many believers live on one spiritual meal a week? This is it. Right here today. Sunday morning. Sermon. You'd be surprised how many believers try to live a whole week on what they gain in one sermon. Some people feed itself a bit more. Uh, this week I, I had a little bite. I, had, I got the program on TV or I got a tape or I read a chapter in a book. I got a little bit extra. Not enough. Not, not enough. And be careful what you eat. If you eat a bunch of junk food that contains no nourishment, your body's going to be weakened. Same for your spirit. You feed on things that have no nourishment, no spiritual nourishment. No wonder your spirit's weak. And when your spirit is weak, you can't overcome. And don't, whatever you do, don't feed the garbage. Don't feed, you don't feed yourself garbage, I hope. So don't feed your spirit man garbage. So let me ask you this morning, are you feeding your inner man, your spirit man? Are you feeding it? How often? How much? Is it getting scraps? 
or you're giving it a good meal once in a while, good sit-down feast. And what are you feeding them? What are you feeding them? I said the five things. The second thing says, God is our source of life and health and strength. We need to be in constant contact with him. We need to commune with him. We need to fellowship with him. We need to be in his presence. And how do I do that? With prayer and worship. Prayer and worship. So are you in touch with him every day? Are you in touch with him every day? Number three, we're told exercise is so important for this, this body, this natural body. Because activity is good. So get involved in doing things for the kingdom of God. Exercise. Spiritual activity. Get involved in helping others. Get involved in praying for others. Get involved in ministering to others. Get involved in the many church activities you have in this place. Get involved in doing something. Number four, keep disease away. Keep it away. Avoid. Resist things that will harm you. We do it in the natural, don't we? Keep away from things that will keep you spiritually sick. Like what? Gossip. Jealousy. Pride. Anger. Bitterness. Envy. The whole list is there in Peter. You'll find it. Keep an eye open for diseases that are likely or try to attack your soul, your spiritual man, I mean. Number five, the last one. Attend to wounds right away. Attend to wounds right away. You cut yourself, what's the first thing you do or should do? Yeah, you bandage, you bandage it up, don't you? Attend to wounds right away. Don't let them fester. Apply the, the ointment of forgiveness to offenses and misunderstandings and hurt. If not, they'll fester. Apply a good wad of ointment. Now, I know these things are not new. You've heard them preached, I'm sure, many times. You probably knew most of the things I said with you, to you. You know what to do. We just need to do them. Stop being hearers and start being doers. So in conclusion, let me just ask a question. What condition is your spirit man? Your inner man. What condition is it in? Sometimes we just need to stop and have a look. You see, your answer to that question is so very, very important. Because it determines how much of an overcomer you are. And it determines how much of an overcomer you will be. Do you want to be an overcomer? Come on, know how to do something. Do you want to be an overcomer or do you care? Well, I would call to you those dozen or more promises that Jesus made to an overcomer and you said they were really good ones I liked every one of them I want to be part of every part of one of them well if I am then I need to be an overcomer so it should be important it's important to me, it should be important to you to be an overcomer so remember the key keep your inner man your inner spirit strong keep it strong because when it fails, you'll fail. Can I give you a suggestion? So often, as you did when you greeted one another, we, we greet another Christian, we say, hi, nice to see you, how are you, God bless you, all sorts of things. Can I suggest once in a while, occasionally, you say to that person, hi, how's your inner man doing? How's your spirit man doing? Remind them. Remind them. Father, thank you for your word. I pray you challenged us, taught us, did something, moved us. 
Lord, I believe each person in this place wants to be an overcomer. I believe each one of those promises in Revelation, among many other promises in your word, are so wonderful. Why would we want to miss out on them? And Lord, I believe the main reason is an overcomer pleases you. When you look down and see a son or daughter overcoming, striving and fighting against sin and the world and the flesh, and you know exactly how hard it is. Jesus, you had to do it. It's not something you, you, you didn't know about. You know exactly. And your word says that when we have these temptations that you are able to make a way out of it for us. Thank you that you'll succour us. You'll run to our side to help us. Thank you for the Holy Spirit who lives within me and has power to help me overcome. Thank you for the weapons, particularly the blood and the word that I can use. Thank you, Father, for the faith that you planted in my heart that's hopefully growing day by day. Thank you for all these things that you've given that we can be overcomers because it pleases you. And we want to please you. I just pray, Father, that when the enemy does come, we do have face a battle. Something that was said this morning. And I pray it's planted in our spirit, man. I didn't hear it with just my mind. I pray that you heard it in your spirit, man. That it was planted there. That the Holy Spirit would just get a hold of it and make it, make it come to, to our minds. To raise it up within our hearts. Father, thank you for the victory. And the victory is Jesus. We just ask now that you will bless us as we take a few moments for communion that you might be honored and blessed further. In Jesus' name we ask it. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.